are back live. Uh, let's recap when we're talking about clock signals. So when we have a flip-flop, remember that we have some data input. There's going to be some data output. But the data is not actually latched into the flip-flop unless you have the rising edge of a clock. And so for any digital system, the clock is the heartbeat. If you think about uh, modern day computers, you know, you're running your, uh, um, your Pentium or i7 or whatever you have in your current PC at a particular gigahertz. Maybe it's uh, 2.3 gigahertz, which means that your frequency <coughs> of your digital circuit is going to be 2.3 gigahertz and the period is 1 over whatever your frequency is. So in this case if we had, uh, well, let's, let's look at a good example of this. And I'll take a relatively easy one. If we have a frequency of 2.5 gigahertz, what is our frequency? So how's your math? I think it's going to turn out to be 0 0.4 nanoseconds, correct? Pardon me? The frequency is 2.5 gigahertz. Oh, I'm sorry, is, is the frequency. And so the period, you're right, the period, the period is going to be 1 over the frequency. And that's going to be 0 0.4 nanoseconds. So the period is that amount of time from one rising edge to the next rising edge. So in this case, our period is what? This is at the 10 nanosecond mark, and this is at the 20 nanosecond mark. So our period is what? Come on, it's like addition. 20 nanoseconds. So you're just counting up how many nanoseconds between the rising edge and the rising edge. So then what would that make the frequency? Frequency is equal to 1 over the period, which is going to be... Give me something. Five. That's a good start. Five zero nanoseconds, right? Well, let's take a look. Here's, here's 10 nanoseconds, right? Oops, I'm sorry. 50 megahertz. I'm going to really mess you all up, aren't I? <laughs> 50 megahertz. Oh, look at this. If our period is 20 nanoseconds, 20 is somewhere between 10 and 100, right? So uh, it turns out that our, our uh, frequency is going to be in between there, and it's going to be 50. You got that? Here's a shortcut. Remember, one nanosecond is one gigahertz. And based on that, you can figure what all these others are as well. Now, here's the important thing. A flip-flop 
is going to be worried about this rising edge, right? Sometimes he worries about a falling edge too. But remember what was inside that flip-flop was two latches. So in, uh, in one, we, uh, we were worrying about the, well, let's see. Where's my picture? Oh, there we go. So we actually have a D latch where the clock is feeding one of the clocks for the latch and the clock and this through a knot gate. And then it's feeding, um, the clock is also feeding the clock on the other latch without the knot gate. This is an important animation to understand. So remember right here at the rising edge, and we'll, uh, we'll take this all the way down. Well, what do you see right now? And I'll take this down too. Because whatever the clock is, CS is immediately because the wire is there. But there will be some small delay through that knot gate. So what do we have here? Let's see how, how well, all right, we do have that. That the, uh, the data here is going to uh, actually drive the output right here. But it's important to note that it doesn't drive this data over here all the way at the end. So on the rising edge of the clock, this signal here will remain the same because it's dependent on this data. But it will not be clocked into here until after our, and we're going to be looking at QS, not until the, the clock, rising edge of the clock right here, actually drives or is uh, provided information with this clock right here. So this clock, let me here show you at this point, this clock will actually drive the output here based on the data that we want to latch into it. So what do you note? What's the most important aspect of here to note? That you usually set your data before you clock it into the flip-flop. So remember, data is made available before you clock it. I want to show, um, oh, and, and I also talked about, as I said, you can have the rising edge of the clock determines your output or the falling determines the output. Probably the best way to uh, take a look at this is to actually look at an example. So let's look at an example. The flight attendant call button using D flip-flops. Remember our D flip-flop is going to store one single bit. And with any sequential circuit, you're going to have the combinational part here, followed by the sequential part here. It turns out that our sequential part is only a single bit. Notice that the clock is only used for the sequential part. There is no clock used in this combinational uh, part of the circuit. Also note that typical in sequential circuits that the output of our sequential part will also be an input to our combinational part. That's where you get the power of sequential logic. 
is that we're going to be using the past knowledge of the system, specifically whatever was identified previously is going to be fed back into our circuit and used for something else. So again, our operation, you press the call button and that will provide data which will be cleared when you press the cancel. So our truth table for our combinational is going to be as such. If the call button is pressed and the cancel or is not pressed and the cancel is not pressed, then you don't care about what the output is. Right? However, if sometime previously Q was 1, meaning somewhere previously the call button was pressed and so the Q input is going to be 1, then you want your output from the combinational logic to be 1. However, if you press the cancel button, it doesn't matter if Q was 0 or 1. When you press the cancel button, you eventually want your output to be D of 0. Now in this case this should be inherently obvious. If you press the call button you definitely want your output to be 1. And in fact it doesn't matter if the button was previous, or it doesn't matter if you were storing that the button was previously pressed you notice that if it's 1, you're always going to have an output of 1. And then comes the problem, what if you press both at the same time? And you have to make a decision. In our case, for our application, if we're pressing both the call and the cancel at the same time, we're going to take the precedence of the call and we're going to make sure that that is pressed. So now what do we have? Take away uh, all this uh, extra stuff I've shown you on the slide. Here is a, what our combinational logic is going to be. We want it, and in fact we could do this with a K-map, right? We could still use K-maps for our combinational circuit over here. So in fact, let's do that. We'll call this uh, call. and cancel and Q. So remembering how we do all this, if call is 0 versus call is 1. If call is ever 1, we want this 1, right? And what is this line right here? This will be a 1 right there. So what is our digital, and then the rest will be zeros. Well, our digital logic is we can now circle all of this. We can circle this as well. And we're going to create the, um, we're going to create the uh, um, digital logic. Let's see, where is it? All right, so our digital logic is going to be, here we have um, Q and cancel. Or call, right? So here we have uh, call, and then here we have Q ended with cancel, so it's active low, so the cancel will actually generate a zero. But then it'll be uh, uh, knotted over there. So that's our combinational logic based on our K-map. 
and then we add it with our individual latch, and there we got it. We have our uh, sequential logic system that works. Want another example? I'm going to make you do this one. So let's uh, make up a problem. Hmm. I got to think of a really good one that. Uh, Light the elevator <laughs> button that goes, uh, that goes, uh, shows you want to go up. turns off when the elevator arrives. Seems pretty easy, right? Yes? All right, so let's look at our inputs. What are our inputs? We have the button press, right? You agree? Man, you guys are, are really sleeping, right? The other input is elevator arrived. At floor. And this assumes that you only have two floors, right? So this will count for the up and the down one. We'll do a more complex one in a second. So what is our output going to be? The light, the button signal, right? So you think about an elevator, and let's say you're on the ground floor, right? There's only one button. So you press the button, and what happens? It lights up, right? And it turns off when the elevator arrives. Now, you don't have to keep pushing the button to indicate that, uh, um, you know, to keep the light on, right? So, do you think you could do this? Do you think you can create this? All right. So, let's pause for a few minutes, and I want you to give me the full digital design. I assure you this is actually easier than the thing I just showed you. For that sequential logic system. All right, there's been some confusion as to how to solve this, so I'll just uh, go through the solution uh, quickly. So, here's the solution. Let's make sure you agree with me on this truth table. So the first thing you do is a truth table. So, I'm saying that whenever the elevator has arrived, you turn off the light. Do you agree with that? Right? The elevator is there. No matter how much you push the button, it's there. So you don't need to light up the button. So look at, look at this. Zero, or I'm sorry, elevator has arrived. 
that's zero. Elevator has arrived, that's zero. Elevator has arrived, that's zero. Elevator has arrived, that's zero. You got that? So, the elevator is not there, and you press the button. That should drive this over here to be a one. Because you're waiting for the elevator, so you light up the button. All right? Now comes the remaining case. Well, first of all, the remaining case if you never pressed anything and you know there's you never have to have a light on. Let's say it's uh, uh, 3 a.m. and there's nobody in the building, so the elevator's not going to move and the light is not on. Got it? So. That's that situation. But then there's the situation where I walk up to the button, I press it, and it records that it was pressed. You know, probably in a situation like this right here. All right? So if I walk up to the elevator and press it, this happens, right? There we go. My output to it is, is going to be D. And then since it's a flip-flop, It'll create a Q for the output, correct? So now it's in this situation. It has been pressed, but it hasn't arrived yet. So you want to make sure that your output D remains 1 until the elevator arrives. When the elevator arrives, there it goes. Then it sets the, uh, the D equal to 0. Got it? Yes or no? <laughs> okay. Yes, question. On the last two, even if the elevator's there, you're pressing the button, it's going to be lit. Have you been have you been there at an elevator and done that? The answer is it doesn't light. Okay. We need them while you're holding it. Well, I mean, yeah, we're we're not going to go that far. <laughs> okay. And that's not what. Yeah. I guess that's what's confusing. That's what. If the elevator is there and you press the button, we don't want it to be on. We don't want the light to be on because the elevator is there. The light only goes on saying, I have acknowledged your button press and we're, gonna, we're coming. So if it's already there, we don't care. We don't want to light it. All right, you got that? Easy? Yeah, all right. <laughs> Q is if the button has been previously pressed, but the elevator did not arrive yet. Now think about this. You go down into the elevator, right? You press the up button. Are you holding your finger on the up button? No. You press it once, and you wait for the elevator to arrive. That's all you're doing. And so it will be continually lit until the elevator then arrives. All right? So did we have another question over there, or did I answer it? Um, I can't see the I'm not uh, there yet. <laughs> all right, so you agree with that truth table, first of all, right? Yes? No? Because I'm going to give a quiz in a few minutes that's even more complex. Question? D, no, D is the signal that you're giving to your combinational circuit. The actual Q is going to be the light. So I'm actually going to, Q is going to be my light. There's my LED. Q means the thing is lit. All right? So if you take this truth table, it is represented in this K-map by this, right? That's pretty easy. That's only two large circles. The two large circles being arrive, or if it has not arrived, and Q is equal to 1. So in other words, you previously pressed the button some time ago, but the elevator is still not there. You want the light to still be on, right? That makes sense. This, I cannot believe. Donuts, yeah, donuts. 
Yay, donuts. Uh, man, I have no idea who that is even. Um, and then, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, uh, I was eating donuts, right? <laughs> and then here's the other situation. When you press the button and it has not arrived yet. That makes sense, right? Because if the elevator has arrived and is sitting there waiting for you, you don't want it, the light to go on because it's there. You just walk in. So you circle these two, and this is my formula up there, or my, uh, um, the equation. So not arrived and Q, or button pressed and not arrived. And there it is. Uh, I got to put my not gate in there for the um, arrive. I should label that. And then, you know, uh, my two AND gates from my uh, equation, uh, since there's an OR in there as well, and that is what I feed to D. You got that? Does that make sense? Yes or no? Kind of. I'm trying to think of another real world example to give you that you could look at this. Hmm. 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 Stroke in the beard. Hmm. All right, question back there. It's the same thing. That's right. So go up, go downstairs, you know, go to the elevator. The button is already lit. Does, pre does pressing the button change it? No. It's still lit. In fact, if you're like me, I just press the button really fast because it makes me happy. It makes it come faster, right? Yeah, right. Question. Well, Q is light the LED and also call the elevator waiting for it to, to arrive. So Q means light, the, I, where I'm, at this point I'm just lighting the little button, all right? I didn't want to complicate anything by calling the elevator to come to where I was. But yes, that also does that. Question. <laughs> Oh, so here's a good question. What if, say that again, if... So you haven't pressed the button. Correct. The left has not come. Like it's zero. Both are zero. All right, both are zero. Why is Q1? Because you previously pressed it. So, uh, I mean, that's the situation where I walk up to the elevator, I press the button, it immediately goes on. That was uh, this situation right here, right? Ten seconds later, I'm still waiting for the elevator. That's that situation right there. Yeah, come on. The elevators are not rocket science, guys. <laughs> All right, anything else? All right, you want me to make your life miserable? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm going to do another example. Are you ready? <laughs> I like this. Do I want to make your life miserable? And you all say no. Not very strongly, though. <laughs> What do you think? Faculty are just around here to make life miserable for students? <laughs> Don't you want to take more of an esoteric uh, uh, attitude of college? We're trying to teach you how to be problem solvers? No. <laughs> do you think company wants people who know how to parrot back facts? That would be somebody who works at McDonald's, all right? A problem solver will take something that we don't know what the solution is 
and you're going to find the solution for it. That's what companies pay people for who are engineers. Yes? Uh, what's the matter? You don't like the blurriness? There. What's the matter? Can't you see this? It's, it's out of focus or something? All right. We have our elevator again, right? Get this. We have an up and a down button. Oh, you don't like this. All right, so, so again, we have uh, light, the two elevator. Buttons up, down. So now you're going to have to control two things. What do you think you're going to want if you're controlling two things? Two what? Two outputs. That means you're going to probably need to have two flip flops. One that's going to record the state of the up button and one that's going to record the state of the down button. Couldn't you just use the opposite states of one? Ah, because that's not necessarily true, right? An elevator may arrive, right? And it's going back up. So you're not either going up or down. I mean, each one of those buttons is completely separate. So, light the two elevators. So your inputs are... You're going to press up button, which I will just call up. You will press the down button, which I will call down. We're going to have the elevator arrive going up, and we'll call this um, travel up, up, there you go. We'll have elevator arrive going down, we'll call this travel down. What do you think we also have? Well, you have the Q for up, the Q for down, which you could just as well call Whoop. <laughs> and QDN, where I'm just making life really easy for you for inputs. And then your outputs are going to be what? The light for up and the light for down. And by the way, the light for up is going to be what? It's just going to be Q up. And the light for down is going to just be Q down. So we're using it both as an input to our combinational circuit and to light our LED. So we're going to design. So what's our steps? Steps number one. Very good, truth table. Step number two. And step number three. 
draw. Now, how many lines will your truth table have? One, two, three, four, five, six. Right? But there's a hand back there. Question. Ah. That would be kind of nuts to do a 64 line truth table when in fact it's really two truth tables. So, sometimes you have to look at the concept and see is it really like two problems that are sitting right next to each other? So, go to it. Solve this in your group. Give you a hint, it's going to be really close to what we've already done. Most everybody got this right, so let's just go over the solution. Oh, I was just mentioning, perfect for Halloween. Look at that, a disembodied finger sitting up on the screen. <laughs> yes, I cut my finger off, put it up there. Isn't it great? Uh, or I could just uh, point like this. And, oh my gosh, it's not there. All right, so um, I love freeze. All right, so here we go. It turns out that, as was identified by somebody in the back, um, it's just two completely separate circuits. Each, each button is completely separate and doesn't have anything to do with the others. However, later on, we're going to do another example of elevators where we'll make it a lot more complex because then we'll actually put in the data associated, should it travel down, should it travel up, who's actually pressed the button on what floor, etc. cetera. So, um, so the down is the same as the up. Uh, the TDN, same as the top, QDN, same as the Q up. Uh, the D, there's going to be a D for up and a D for down. It's going to have the same K map. And so that's all it is is two of the same circuit. Exactly the same circuit. Yes, sir? Nah, so here's the question. Can you have two Sep or just one flip-flop? So, so here's the question. And, and, and that's a good question right there. Why, why does my design show two flip-flops? <laughs> because it's a completely different operation. So I can't actually use just one single flip-flop for this entire circuit. I must have two because I have Actually, it's a total of four different states of my lights, right? So I could have, um, and in fact, if I were to uh, add this in, that's a good question, though, and we're going to look at that later. Here's my LED, right? And uh, remember, if you have an LED, you need to uh, include your... Uh, um, uh, current limiting uh, uh, resistor in there. So, uh, well, it's simply this light is on or off. This light is on or off. How many total different states are there? Four. So it turns out that you would need to have one flip flop for two states, two flip flops if you have three or four states. And actually, you would need a, a uh, third flip-flop if you had five, six, seven, or eight states. In other words, the number of flip-flops you need is an order of two of the different states that your system has. And actually, the, uh, um, uh, the concept of having multiple states of our system is the subject of our next class. Thank you very much.